All right. Hi, everyone. This is Tony Meyer from Test Tracks, and the man you see before you is Ricky Hansen. Uh, Ricky is a graduate of Harvard College. He did Teach for America for three years and is now at GW Law. Um, I'll let him talk about the rest of his background and experience, um, but just so you know, on the left-hand side of your screen is a chat button that when you hit on the right will pop up a chat, and in there you'll be able to post any questions you have during the talk so that Ricky can um, answer anything you have and uh, you can uh, ask him any questions you have along the way. And without further ado, Ricky, if you want to take it off. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tony. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for taking the time to... I know it's kind of late, so uh, thank you so much for, for coming on this. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to shed some light on uh, what the teaching experience is like and what uh, TFA is like. Uh, obviously, this is just one uh, perspective of, of many, but uh, hopefully I'll give you a, a real and honest uh, perspective. And uh, if you have any questions at all during, during the entire presentation, please just post them, and uh, I'll try to stop after each slide uh, and, and address any questions uh, that, that you might have. Um, and if you can't hear me for some reason or, or something like that, please let me know and I'll try to speak louder. Um, okay, so uh, I, I assume, and, and Tony, actually this is a question for you, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides will be sent to them after this, is that correct? Yes, so okay. tomorrow you guys are all going to receive um, the PowerPoint and presentation that Ricky has. Great, yeah, so for now, uh, there might be something that I say too quickly or something like that, uh, so please let me know if I should repeat myself or anything like that. Okay, so as Tony said, uh, I just started at George Washington University uh, in D.C. Uh, and I finished up with the first semester, um, halfway through the second semester now, and to be honest, I really do love it. Uh, it's a great place, very supportive. Uh, law school is uh, a really great place to be, especially after teaching. Um, and I'll, obviously, I'll get I'll get to that in, in a moment. But it really gives you uh, a great perspective, and it makes you appreciate uh, being a student uh, again. Uh, and I, I don't think that I that I would have had that kind of uh, understanding if I just went straight from college uh, into law school. Um, so before before this, I was in Phoenix for Teach for America. I taught for three years. Uh, the first two were just the the commitment years, uh, but I stayed a third year at my same school because I, I really enjoyed the experience uh, and I wanted to work with the kids that were that were coming up in the grade. Uh, and I also worked as a staffer helping out uh, the new core members and trying to give them uh, some uh, some of my, my ideas on curriculum planning and lesson development and, and things like that. Uh, and then before that, as Tony said, uh, I was at Harvard with him and it was a wonderful time. All right. So, the, the presentation overview, there will be a number of, uh, of hints and advice that I'll kind of repeat and, and come back to. Um, so my, my main ones are, I, I believe that most of you have just started with college, uh, and my biggest piece of advice is to pursue your passions, no matter what they are, because Teach for America, they, they take anyone. It uh, doesn't matter what your major is. Um, but I would uh, temper that with the advice that you should not overstretch yourself. Um, and college can be a very stressful time. Um, I know it's different for everybody, but sometimes you, as you progress and you get more involved with things, uh, all the responsibilities pile up, and, and I just warn you against overstretching. Um, as far as Teach for America goes and, and preparing for that in particular, I would urge you to try to teach before you teach. Uh, do something, whether it be just working with kids um, as, a, uh, as a, a recreation leader, which I did one of my summers, um, or actually tutoring and doing some actual lesson planning. Uh, whatever it may be, I think it's important to try to work with some kids so you know that, hey, maybe I actually do want to help kids and teach kids, or you might realize, oh my God, I can't, I can't handle these these little hellions. Um, but it's it's good to try to get that understanding um, before before you go into a two year commitment. Um, it's also important to build your narrative, uh, and this kind of goes with the teaching and the extracurriculars. But you always want to be thinking during college, 
what is it that I can basically write on a personal statement? Uh, what is it I can put on a resume? Something that's cohesive, that um, makes you who you are. And if you just do a bunch of random little things, uh, you're not going to have that compelling story that you can tell employers and then you can tell TFA uh, or law school. Um, so think about that early on and, and try to build on that theme uh, over the years. Okay, so as far as education goes, and, and I guess this is the, the industry piece and what TFA tries to fix, uh, my themes there are that the education system is broken. I'm sure you've read lots of things, heard it in the news. It, it, it is broken, and we're trying so many different ways to fix it. Uh, TFA is a great way to try to tackle the problem, but it's definitely not a magic bullet. Uh, and and so you'll have to decide for yourself if, if you think that it really is a strong organization and one that you want to be working for. And there, you know, it, there's a whole controversy over TFA. I personally believe that it's doing the right thing, but I'll talk about that later. Um, and then finally, teaching itself is a very difficult practice. And it takes years of really hard work to be great at it. It, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how talented you are. It's just really, really hard to be a great teacher. Anybody can uh, sit in a room and, and babysit a group of 25, 30 kids, um, but to actually be a great teacher, it, it, it takes many years. And even after 15, 20 years, those teachers are still learning and trying to realize how to be uh, better for the kids. Um, so before I go on to the next thing, I, I see that there's a question from Joseph. Hey, Joseph. Um, I hear you say, how do you know if you're overstretching? Um, I would say that uh, you're overstretching when you're a part of, I would say, three, four organizations, and you're trying to pursue leadership roles in all of them. Right? That, that's overstretching. I would say that if you are really committed to one, two organizations, and you are, are truly leading those organizations and, and doing um, uh, really important work for them, that is a good place to be. Uh, but if you start going beyond and doing four or five organizations, I personally think that's too much. But obviously, it depends on what organizations. It depends on, on how much you worry about your GPA, which is, is a really important thing. So you have to find that right balance. And um, at the end of the day, grade point average, unfortunately, <laughs> is really important. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, and from Greg, sorry if this is too early, but um, actually, can someone read that question for me? I can't see the whole thing. Uh, Tony, can you help me out? Yes. So Greg asks, sorry if this is too early, but is TFA worth it if you can't be a great teacher when you start? Oh, yeah, of course. No one's a great teacher when you start. <laughs> no, not, I, I mean, it, it's just true. Not a single person is a great teacher when you start. Um, and you will have a lot of training um, from TFA, from your school district, from the graduate school, which you will most likely be a part of to get your master's degree. Um, you get so much advice, sometimes too much advice. Um, but you, you will get tons of resources and tons of training. Um, and, and you will become a great teacher. Great teachers are not born. They are made. Um, and so. You just have to keep that in mind. You have to stay patient and just know that it's a process. Um, I, I really know, I know very, very few teachers who uh, were having great results by the end of their first year. Um, and, and so it's just something where you have to work at it and you have to try your best. And you can still be a good teacher your first year, but it, it takes a while to be a great teacher. Um, and then Greg, so Greg continued, um, yeah. but TFA is only two years, so how good are you at the end, slash, are you spending two years learning something you never end up using? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I would say that you can be a good teacher by the end of your first year, and that you can be really quite good during your second year and, and make some really... Um, big changes and quite a difference with, with your kids. I personally felt it, it was a good idea to, to continue a third year for a number of reasons, one of which was I thought I could be an even better teacher my third year. 
Um, I also knew that the particular group of kids coming up that year were um, were really motivated, and I really wanted to be a part of, of, of the kind of culture that they had built from the previous year. And so there are just a number of factors involved. Um, as far as after TFA, I think that teaching applies to really any job that, that you would continue on uh, with. Teaching, it just makes you, the, the way they train you to be a teacher, it makes you think how to break things down. And that's something that you can take with you to any industry, just be able to explain things to people, um, and especially in law school for me, uh, just knowing how to break things down in my, in my papers. I mean, so far, it's been going great. I got an A in my legal research and writing class. Um, it's still continuing to be a great experience. Um, and I, I really think that's because of what I did as a, as a teacher, and particularly a writing teacher, and just knowing how to break information down. Um, all right. I think I'll continue for now, and in a little bit I can answer any other questions. So please, please post them. OK, uh, my, my classes, I'll just briefly go through this. Uh, during, during college, um, I majored in government. I minored in global health and health policy. Um, one of my favorite parts um, at Harvard was uh, taking cross-registered courses at the Kennedy School of Government. So wherever you are, I'm, I'm not sure what schools uh, you guys are at, but if you have an opportunity to take some courses at the graduate school, First of all, I mean, the great thing about that is it, it looks really good on, on your transcript. Um, usually, they are actually easier courses. They don't require as much work from you during the semester. Um, and they are also, at least I found, to be the most interesting classes I took at Harvard. And they were way more practical, um, at, especially at the Kennedy School of Government. I took one class on running for office, managing campaigns, another one on, on health policy, and, and um, it was just, it was the kind of uh, class that, that you never forget. So um, I would urge you to, to try to do that. And then my, my little piece of advice on classes, make sure you take classes you are really interested in, and, and don't pick them because they start after 12 o'clock or something like that, which I was guilty of. Um, try to go to office hours um, and, and try to, befriend at least one or two professors because you will need them and it's also a, an amazing experience and um, also take some some quantitative classes some econ if at all possible I did not do that so I, I, I definitely regret that <laughs> all right uh, my club activities that's where I really focus my energy I didn't do um, I, I did okay uh, as far as grades go but um, I definitely put more of my energy in, in clubs a lot of MUN. Um, I was the secretary general of the college conference at Harvard, and then I founded the conference that takes place in January um, in Latin America, in a different place in Latin America each year. And um, and I also was a part of the College Democrats, and uh, in conjunction with the Democrats, we we specifically went into a Boston public school uh, with citizen schools and did basically a class focused on political campaigns. All right, I see a question here before going to the next slide. Um, can professors help you get a job when you graduate? Um, that is certainly a possibility. I think it, it really depends on how close you are with the professor, but undoubtedly, um, I, I, I think the importance of networking it cannot be underestimated um, or understated. It, it's, it's one of those things where you, it, it, it's not the most fun, uh, but at the end of the day, by doing it, you will feel good about it. You'll have these more lasting connections. Um, and so I, I think it really is important to, to stay connected, um, especially after you graduate. It's much harder to stay in touch, but just sending even a holiday message to try to keep in touch is really important. Um, it's important for your letters of recommendation um, and, and, of course, getting connections and getting advice um, from presumably someone who is a mentor um, and someone who can tell you and, and steer you in the right direction and give you some names of people to call up. Um, and that's how I got my, my internship uh, with uh, for the summer is through an inter informational interview. 
Um, just getting a name of someone, asking basically what they do uh, for their job. They forwarded my resume, and I got my internship. So uh, I, I think it's very, very important to keep those connections. All right, um, moving to internships. Perfect. Uh, I During college, I was a part of um, Organizing for America for one of my summers. Uh, I was basically doing a bunch of phone calls, uh, knocking on doors, uh, and it was to try to build uh, support for uh, President Obama's agenda uh, during that time in 2010. Uh, before that, uh, I was able to work for Senator Kennedy when he was still alive, uh, right at the end, uh, working for his health committee for health policy. Uh, and that was at the time when the, the health care law was uh, was just being developed, uh, and his committee was the first uh, out of either the House or the Senate to produce the first bill. Obviously, it was it was transformed and, and changed during the process, but um, it really was a, a life life changing uh, internship. And then before that, I worked for basically Parks and Recreation, um, and it was. Some, in some ways similar to the actual TV show, but uh, it, it was a great way to work with kids um, and and help me realize uh, that I really did want to do some time teaching and helping kids uh, after after college. Okay, how to join TFA, uh, which I'm sure is, is, is most important to, to all you guys. Um, like I said before, I think it's really important to pursue your interests. Um, again, whatever that might be, uh, because TFA is not looking for a particular kind of person. They're not looking for education majors. To be honest, they're looking for people quite the opposite. Um, and uh, I would say, especially people in STEM, um, if you are a math major or uh, if you are working in, in you know some science-related background, um, that can be really, really uh, enticing for TFA interviewers because they want someone who is a real expert and someone who can inspire those children to follow in your footsteps um, when they when they get older. Um, I would also suggest that you be a leader in whatever you pursue. Um, and I, again, going back to not overstretching, make sure that you're trying to be a leader in one or two organizations. Um, and and being a leader of, of some organization can be hard if you just look at it as like, oh man, how, how, do, I, how do I do that? How do I get in charge of this 200-person um, organization? And I would say the best way to do that is just to work hard. Pay your dues. Show that you can do all the little grunt work your first and second year, um, that you have new ideas, that you know how to make the organization more efficient. And if you do all those little things, People will be impressed, um, and and it'll it'll really happen without you even thinking about it. Um, you just put in the hard work, and you will basically be a leader by example, and you will rise up, and you will be on top uh, of the organization by by your junior senior year. Um, and then finally, the teach before you teach uh, piece of advice. You don't have to be a part of some uh, volunteer organization where you tutor or anything like that. Um, that's not a, a prere prerequisite for TFA, but I just think that just to make sure you know you want to work with kids, you should do something related to that. Uh, and as TFA becomes more competitive, I do think it, it might be helpful to actually do some lesson planning um, and to do something more education related. If, if you really know at this point that you want to do TFA. Um, I think that would help and show and to show the interviewers that you are um, really dedicated to, to doing that. Um, Rebecca, I uh, see a question here. Does the organization, again, sorry, it's cut off here. Let me, let me, oh, there we go. Does the organization matter that you lead? Um, no, no, it does not matter. Uh, I, I think it just, Going back to my point about your personal narrative, I think it should make sense to who you are, uh, and it shouldn't just be some random thing that you tried for one year and gave up. Now, it, it's okay if you try something, maybe your freshman year, and you know it just doesn't work out, and and you realize you don't like it. 
that's totally fine. Um, but the more things, and, and I guess it's it's okay if you just never talk about it in interviews and or anything like that. But the more things you do, that's and, and the more things you quit, obviously that's time wasted, um, not being dedicated to something where you can actually be a leader later on. So you just have to try to think about what you really care about. Um, but again, the organization itself doesn't matter. It's just something that you're passionate about. All right. Again, if you have any other questions, please just keep posting them. Thanks. Um, moving on. My regrets. My biggest regrets. Please focus on grades. So again, I'll, I'll just be upfront and honest with you. I had a, a 3.6 GPA, um, which I don't think is, is bad, um, but I, at the same time, for where I wanted to go to law school, it it hurt me. Um, and if you have a vision after TFA of, of what you want to do, then you really at this point need to focus on your grades and make sure that you're at a certain level and, and look at, at what the averages are for whatever law school or grad school that you want to go to and just have that in mind um, as you're taking your classes, picking them, and, and studying for finals um, because I, I didn't really do that. I didn't really think about that um, as much as I should have. Um, Joseph, I will pause for your question. Uh, whoopsies, I lost it. All right, here we go. Uh, how much did TFA help with law school? Does it make up for low test scores and GPA? Um, it, it's it's hard to tell. I. I I, I want to say it, it does help. Um, I think it's important to show that you have some work experience. Law school will definitely want to see that. Um, but for the most part, your GPA and your LSAT are the most important pieces of the puzzle. Um, uh, I, beyond that, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, I can't really quantify how much TFA helps, but I, I think it does. Um, and, and beyond just that, as far as getting into a certain law school, TFA also has, um, there are certain schools that will give scholarships to, to those who, um, who who committed for two years to TFA. Uh, you have application fee waivers for a lot of schools um, if you did TFA. So there are certain perks, I, I guess, uh, that, that come along with uh, doing TFA. And the TFA help at all with being in law school? Yes. Yes, no doubt. I, I really, truly believe that I have a better perspective than a vast majority of my classmates. Um, I, I, I just feel that I'm, I'm more prepared as far as breaking down information. Um, and I also think that I'm more relaxed in a way because I understand how hard teaching was. And I, I mean, in, in comparison, you know, waking up two hours later to just go be a student and, and worry about myself and, and do readings about interesting cases uh, where I don't have to worry about the lives of 60 or 120 students. It's, it's, it's nice. It's nice to, <laughs> to be able to reflect on that and, and take a deep breath and realize that like I, I'm a really lucky person right now. Um, not, not to say a TFA <laughs> is, is miserable or anything. Um, it, it actually is very rewarding. Um, but it's, it's nice to have that experience to compare to. Um, and then, Joseph, again, uh, how many hours a week is TFA? Is it easier than consulting or finance? Um, interesting question. It is, it is as easy or hard as you want to make it, I think, in some cases. But it also depends on where you are. It really is, is highly dependent on where you are placed. Um, there are many regions in, in the United States that have many more charter schools now. And from what I've heard and from what I've um, you know, been working with teachers from a number of different schools, anecdotally, uh, I've realized that it's much harder to work in a charter school. Um, because they don't have as many resources, and um, they're they're just starting out new. They might have great ideas, but at the same time, they, they don't have the kind of resources and training that a uh, traditional public school district has. 
And so I think that can make the experience a lot harder. Um, so you don't have a lot of control over that. Um, but at the same time, you kind of do. Um, because so, so just to give you a background on, on how TFA works, you're supposed to accept the first place who offers you a job. You're supposed to just take it. Um, so uh, this might sound a little shady, but if you're in an interview and you realize, like, oh my god, this place is a freaking zoo, um, then maybe you're not going to try as hard in your interview. Maybe you'll say some things that, you know, might, might cost you that job. Maybe, okay, because there's probably some other school out there that you could, um, you know, do some better things at. I know that sounds a little shady, and, and you know, you can take that advice as you, as you will, but it, it, where you are placed makes a big difference in your experience. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a tough job, so I, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that advice with you, and you can take it as, as you will. Um, but I definitely know some people who did that because there are some schools that are really struggling out there. And, and you might want to take the challenge. Um, and, you know, one teacher can make a big difference. Um, but at the same time, your administration, the people in charge, they, they, will, um, they will greatly affect uh, how you work and how you feel during the year. Okay, <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, again, please post any questions that, that you might have. Um, and, and going back to Joseph's question one more time, sorry. Um, I, I think that, that as far as I've heard talking to people in consulting and finance, teaching is, is way more fun than, than those jobs. Right? There might be some crazy places where it's just the school not run well, but by and far, for the most part, you will have a lot of fun working with those kids, and you a lot of the times will will get um, what you put in, um, and, and, right? And the more more you try and and work hard for your kids, um, usually they'll work hard for you as well. Okay. Um, so I have a slide here. When you guys get a chance, when it gets sent out, I won't I won't play it now. Um, but it's a little slide about, again, why, why teach, because it can be really hard, um, and, and you don't always get paid the, the best. It depends on, on where you live. Um, obviously, if you're in a place like New York or D.C. or the standard of living is higher, then you'll be paid um, more, something usually around 60000 for some place like New York or D.C., which for a teacher, not bad, but you also have a rent that, you know, could be between fifteen hundred and two thousand, um, and then in Phoenix, where I was, I was paid approximately mm, like thirty five hundred, um, and or sorry, thirty five thousand, uh, and uh, but my rent was around six hundred. So you know, it really depends on on where you are. But again, going back to that PowerPoint, you can click on the on the little link. It's a like a spoken word uh, poetry uh, about why teachers matter and, and the difference they make. It's a, it's a really cool video. It's like three minutes. All right. Rick, if you yeah. want, we can share the video now, or you can have them watch it offline, whichever you prefer. Yeah, they can just watch it later. Yeah, that, that's totally fine. I, I assume that, I don't know, how, how, I, I'm not really sure how much time we have, so I'm, I'm just worried about getting through everything. You have about 27 minutes left. Okay. Yeah, um, Yeah. They, they can watch it later. That's fine. All right. Um, so moving moving on to the, uh, the education system. Um, just a few things that I, I wanted to highlight. I've already mentioned a few. Um, there are a number of, you know, this is basically why TFA exists and, and, and the kind of environment that TFA is facing. There are are a number of inexperienced teachers, the new TFA teachers included, um, and they are the ones usually going into poor neighborhoods. And there's a very high turnover rate. Now, some people would argue, and I have a, another link um, later on uh, kind of describing this, the TFA controversy. There are some people who think that TFA is, in a way, causing the high turnover rate because 
Um, they basically break up unions and, um, which again, I, I'm not sure how true this is, but this is what I've read and heard. Um, and they allow those those former districts who were um, having to pay much more, now they can pay a lot less for these new TFA teachers um, and that allows them to save a lot of money. So um, there's that side of it. But then there's the other side, which I think is more of the case, where there are a lot of teachers who, who can't handle and are not able to produce the kind of results necessary um, in the classrooms, and they leave to go work somewhere else, even in the same district um, or a neighboring district. But as a result, there's a very high turnover rate. And so I believe that TFA serves a really important purpose in putting energetic, motivated, highly intelligent teachers into the classroom, albeit n not the most experienced. However, you do get a lot of training and advice um, during those two years, and you become a much better teacher over time. Um, all right, the other aspects of the education system, as I said, there are a lot more charter schools. Again, my personal view is that charter schools are not the answer. Um, a, a lot of that is based on my experience in Arizona, because there are a lot of, or there are uh, very few laws regulating the charter schools, and a charter school can go five years without being monitored, and then when the government realizes that they are failing kids, then they basically renew it for another five years and say, you know, change these things. And so basically, you can have a failing, terrible charter school go on for 10 years. 10 years of those kids being um, neglected. And so that, that's really disturbing for me. Um, but that's the situation. And that's, I don't think that's TFA's fault. Um, you know, TFA is just providing teachers. And so uh, I, I personally would try to stay away from charter schools. But again, those kids need good teachers at the same time. So um, that's something that you have to personally think about. Uh, schools in general, no matter what kind of school, it's much more data focused now, uh, much more standardized based. And so you have to be prepared to do a lot of data tracking. Um, you could, because TFA is huge on that, and obviously that's that's something that um, our federal government and state governments, um, it, you know, it's all tied to funding, and so that's what everyone pushes: data, data, data. Um, and you you could um, you know try to neglect your responsibilities and and not track as much, but um, I don't know. I'm, I I have a guilt complex, and so. I, I, I always felt stressed out and, and needing to get that, that data in, and that's something that you're going to face. Um, it's going to be a lot of Excel sheets. Um, there are certain things to make it easier. Um, nowadays, there are uh, certain sites like GradeCam where you have basically uh, a Scantron that you can print out, and then you hold it up to the camera, like this camera right here, and it'll grade everything automatically for you. Um, and so you can get results really quickly. Obviously, if you're a writing teacher, then you need to do it the uh, old-fashioned way and, and grade it that way. Um, and so it takes you a little bit longer. But um, it really depends on, on what you're teaching and how many subjects you teach. Uh, let me pause for a second. Rebecca, uh, you said, what do you mean by data? OK, so um, data is basically the test scores. That's, that's what schools care about, uh, for better or worse. Um, and and it depends on what you're teaching. So um, for if you're a math teacher, then you need to be ideally putting a, at least one test or one quiz every week at the, at, the, at the very, very least. And there are a number of schools out there that expect you to have um, uh, exit tickets and little assessments every single day. And so you have to just keep that in mind that you'll be held responsible for tracking that information in Excel sheets or sometimes a school will provide you, um, usually they'll provide you a particular kind of software that you'll have to input the grades. Um, uh, but but that's, that's the kind of uh, data I'm talking about. Does, does that make sense, Rebecca, hopefully? Um, 
If that doesn't make sense, you can post another question. Um, all right, and then uh, just the last couple things about the education system. Um, oh, sweet. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, the, the higher rigor uh, that comes with Common Core is also an, uh, another thing that makes the job a little bit harder. I think it's uh, a step in the right direction, but I also think that the test results are going to be disastrous. Uh, because the the higher rigor, obviously these kids have never done the, uh, for example, I'll take math. Um, before Common Core, a lot of math tests were based on, you know, giving equations, plug in the numbers, you know, make the equations work. But now Common Core is much more focused on problem solving and word problems. And so just adding that one factor there is going to make it much harder for, for kids. And even the the way that, that students have to take tests, um, it's much more computer-based now. And so kids have to realize how to do not just multiple choice tests, but now they're they're expected to do pick all that apply. Like, you know, we, we've done those tests later on, but, but now first, second, third graders are expected to do these things. Um, and so... And in short, in short answer responses, essays are supposed to be typed out now. And, and a major issue is just having enough computers for everyone, having the servers that can actually handle all that, um, all those computers on at the same time, and um, kids needing to type. Right? These kids, they a lot of them have cell phones, but they don't know how to type. They're terrible. And so you're now expected to be not just a writing teacher, but a typing teacher. And so those... Those are the, the, the little aspects that you might not think of uh, when you go into TFA, but they are a very real um, uh, reality. <laughs> uh, great. I uh, see here. Sorry if this is off topic, but one of my professors called Common Core evil. <laughs> Why is it so acrimonious? Um, I would say that Common Core basically takes a lot of the standards. So so before Common Core, each state had its own set of standards. And they were quite specific about the little things that you need to teach. And basically, Common Core took those standards, put them into bigger, broader umbrella topics, and then also raised the level of, of the writing that's expected. There's something called a Lexile level. And uh, that, that basically reading level, they expect uh, students to read at a higher level at an earlier age. Um, and so all those, and, and so in, in the standards, um, they basically ask a teacher to do a number of things in one standard that they call a standard. But what they've done is basically take up like 10 standards and make it into one. And so it, it's incumbent on the teachers to break that standard down. And that's what I was talking about before. As a teacher, you'll be trained on how to break information down. And that's a great skill to learn for, again, any job you go into. And so that's what, that's what makes Common Core harder. And I think Common Core also, I think some people would say Common Core is maybe quote unquote evil um, because you know people like Jeb Bush uh, was a big proponent of Common Core. And, and he's much more of a business. Uh, oriented person, and a lot of the, and, and I believe that uh, the Gates Foundation was uh, heavily involved in developing the Common Core standards, and so in some ways that's good because we have people in the business world who are trying to give advice as to what kids need to do to be prepared for the 21st century and the 21st century economy, um, but at the same time now you're not thinking about the entire economic sector. You're not thinking about the individual needs of children. You're kind of thinking about, as business leaders, what they want and what they they need out of out of basically you know worker bees. So I I, I can see why some people don't like Common Core. Um, but I, I I personally believe that it's a step in the right direction. But we're going to go through a lot of growing pains to uh, to make it work. And the other good thing about it is that it does make standards um, if for the majority of states who are involved. Um, it makes it standard across the board, so now you can actually 
do comparisons between states about how students are actually doing. Because before, you would look at how the, how the statistics are for each state, and, and it's just kind of hard to compare if you're all doing different standards at, at different levels of rigor. I hope that makes sense. OK, uh, and then going back to, to our, our slides here. Um, I'll, I'll move on from the education system. I think I've, I've talked, <laughs> talked about it enough. Um, uh, going to TFA in particular. So again, TFA in, in the midst of, of all, all these dilemmas and, and difficulties, they are their, their main goal. And again, I, I, I know that there's a lot of controversy and, and people think that TFA is just trying to um, you know, and, and, you know, maybe they're just partnering up with companies, and they, it's just a money-making machine. But I, I really don't think that's the case. Um, I, I think that that fundamentally they're trying to get energetic, hardworking, bright people into needy classrooms and to help those children as quickly as possible. Because there is a high turnover rate. Um, that that's just you know that happened, and even before TFA existed. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, th those you know, we, we don't want to have a shortage of teachers, and we don't want to have kids who are being taught by substitutes the whole year. E even if a Teach for America core member is not the most experienced, I, I, I guarantee you that that teacher is going to be much better than three, four, five substitutes during the year. Um, then TFA. Beyond just the teacher aspect, their goal is to also make those teachers lifelong advocates for education reform, which I think is invaluable. And that's something that I, that I personally will be dedicated to no matter what I do uh, later on. Obviously, I'm in law school now, but um, I've always wanted to work in government. I mean, that's my, my job this, this summer is working for the uh, Los Angeles County Council. and. You know, I, I want to be in a position at some point in my life to affect policy change. And some people want to stay teachers, and that is awesome, and we need great teachers. Um, some people want to be school leaders, principals, um, and some people want to work on policy, like me. So, you know, getting people really invested uh, in education reform is a really important part of TFA. Um, and. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for now. I mean, I think those are the two basically major prongs of, of what TFA tries to do. Let me see if any. Nope, no more questions. Cool. All right, a day in the life. This this would probably make more sense if, if you guys were looking at it, uh, but I, I will I will I will try to do a little rundown. Um, so a day in my life, I would wake up at six fifteen. I would uh, hit the snooze button, obviously. Uh, and then at 6.30, I would finally wake up, uh, arrive at school, hopefully by 7.15, hopefully with a cup of coffee. Um, and then at that point, I, I really needed to uh, pray that the copier w wouldn't jam and it could actually work for me. Um, at 7.45, I would have duty, uh, meaning I basically stood outside a bathroom and make sure people weren't screwing around. and. Um, I greeted people, I greeted kids as they came in, tried to build some relationships. Um, at 8.05, I would pick up kids, um, make sure that they, they, they walked in a straight line, which is much harder to do than, than, uh, than it sounds. Um, then once we got into the classroom, I would always start with handshakes, because uh, I personally believe that uh, teaching students from an early age, I had seventh graders. Um, but I think teaching them a strong, firm handshake with eye contact um, is something, it's a skill that's invaluable. Um, and no matter what profession they go into, if they can do that, and that's, you know, that's the first impression they give someone who's interviewing them for a job, that, that is uh, a crucial uh, thing to teach them. Every single day, handshakes. Even if they were sick, maybe I'll give them a little fist bump, but you know. Um, and then we would talk about good things in their lives, try to keep things positive, um, and, and give some affirmations, um, telling other students what, what things they've done um, good for each other. Then at that point, we would break out into interventions. And a lot of schools do this. They have uh, intervention time so that they can basically prepare students for the, the state tests and the benchmark tests. Um, and I think that really is an important time for you to 
you know, it, 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 I guess it sounds kind of bad, but, I mean, you need to teach them basically test-taking strategies. You need to teach them process of elimination. You need to teach them how to highlight, underline. Um, you know, those little things you can teach during the normal school day, but to reinforce them in interventions and to help out the low kids, medium kids, push the high kids, um, to do that kind of work is uh, really important to try to do a little bit each day. Um, and then we'd have the normal classes. Um, so I, I had four, four blocks. Um, I taught writing and, and social studies in a block of 80 minutes, which goes by really, really quickly. And there were a lot of days where I didn't get through everything. But um, it was incredibly fun. I, I loved it. I tried to do, you know, because I did uh, MUN, I tried to do historical simulations with them for the Civil War and for uh, uh, the, the, the Roaring Twenties, drinking root beer, you know, things like that in our little speakeasy. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It, it, I, obviously, that is um, the heart of, of your job, um, working with those kids during the normal teaching time. And I loved it. Um, it you'll be trained uh, before that all happens. So if, if that sounds daunting, don't worry. It will help you. I'm always happy to give, give advice or help out if you, if you ever need that as well. Um, and at the end of the day, at around 3.30, um, I usually would coach a sport, football. Uh, I coached basketball. Um, uh, every, like, once a month, we rotated, and I would hold detention. Detention's always fun. Um, and then after all that, uh, the first year was, for me, particularly difficult um, be because of all the things you had to do after teaching. Um, I had to do grad school class for... I want to say four hours uh, every Monday, which made Monday like really miserable. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, we had TFA trainings usually once a week or once every other week. Um, so that was another two and a half hours or so um, on a different day. And then you had a lesson plan. You had to get ready for the next day. You had to gather all your resources. You had to make sure that you thought through everything so that when you're in front of 30 kids, you know, you don't freak out and stumble and, and you know, make sure that you can actually teach them. Um, and then you try to sleep. Uh, you know, some people are more efficient than others. I try to get six, seven hours each night. Um, my, my girlfriend, she was able to get at least eight hours because she got her shit done on, on Sundays. She got, it, you know, everything done on the weekends. Um, I, I guess I wasn't as efficient. But, um, you know, it just depends on, on who you are. So that's a day in the life. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, please let me know. Um, and then the the roles, the, the roles and responsibilities in general. Um, again, it depends on on the school district. Um, but my school, you needed to have uh, unit plans um, usually to try to tell them what you were going to do for the next four to like eight weeks. Um, you know what you were trying to build up to. Like for example. Uh, teaching writing, we would have an expository writing unit um, and, or a persuasive writing unit. And so by the end of like four or five weeks, I wanted them to produce a five paragraph persuasive essay. Um, and so you kind of had to have an idea of where you were going to go for those five weeks, which makes you uh, uh, less stressed out to know, to know exactly what you're doing um, for those weeks. It makes you feel a lot better um, about things. And then obviously the lesson plans. Uh, depending on what you teach, uh, you know, if you're teaching lower grades, you usually have 30 kids. Um, so it's not as much grading, right, because you only have 30 or, or 25 kids. Um, but then you're also teaching six subjects, so you have to plan a lot more. I, I didn't like that. I, I didn't want to have to plan more subjects. I would rather have more kids and grade more. Um, and so I was happy where I was at teaching 120 kids, four classes, um, but then only two subjects that I had to plan for. So it, it, it depends on, on what you'd rather do. And then, um, the obviously, the, the data tracking, that takes a good amount of time, getting all those Excel sheets for TFA and your school. Um, and then uh, your grad school assignments, research papers, um, you know, that, that is more of a, you know, it's not a daily thing, but there are certain weekends where you're like, oh, crap, like I have uh, this 
you know, 10 page paper to write. So that creeps up on you sometimes. Um, and then coaching or club coordinating, right? You might be uh, head of the National Honor Society for, for your kids, or you might coach basketball or soccer or something like that. And that, that depending on how much time you want to put in, um, I, I spent usually an hour and a half um, for three or four days out, uh, out of the week, um, but I loved it. And that's where I built, built really um, important relationships with kids, especially kids, if they're in sports, some of them um, are not as good academically, and so you can use basketball to motivate them and, and say, you're not going to play if you don't bring up your grades. So, um, I always love bribing kids. All right, uh, let's look at the questions. Uh, what was easier, uh, Joseph, what was easier the second year, and what wasn't easier? Um, the lesson planning was way easier. Uh, my first year, I was teaching three subjects, uh, reading, writing, and social studies, and it, for me, it just felt like a lot, especially my first year um, and, and doing all the other things I talked about. Um, that was tough. But then I switched my second year to teach uh, just writing and social studies because I, I specifically talked to my principal about it, and I told him that I would be a much more effective teacher if I could focus on, on two subjects. And, and that's totally fine to have an honest conversation. If you work hard, and, and you have a, you know you built a good relationship with your principal by showing that you get your stuff done, then you can have conversations about switching positions and going to something that you think you would be more effective at. And, and that really made my life a lot easier uh, during my second year. Um, and what wasn't what was harder about my second year? Um, I, I mean I guess having more kids. I went from 60 kids to 120. Um, and those kids were also really low. My second year, I mean, it just it happens. Sometimes you have a batch of kids for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't have the best teachers in the past. Maybe you have a lot of a lot of students who who recently moved to the district. Um, and so you know, I I really like those kids, but they were quite low. And and so it was there were a number of hard days because of that. But um, I still enjoyed it. Uh, did I ever teach something wrong? What happens? <laughs> Great question. Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. Um, the important thing is to stop yourself. You can even do it mid-lesson. And you just, you're honest. Always be honest with the kids. I think that goes a long way. Because if you are ever dishonest, if you ever lie to them, um, or or if you just, you know, if you misteach something and and they kind of find out later on, you know, kids are smart, right? A lot of kids can see through BS. And so I think it's much more important to be honest with them and be like, guys, I screwed up. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. You know what? Cross that out. Put a big X through that. And I made a little mistake. Everyone's human. And then you and you fix it, right? If, it, if you realize later on, like, you know, at night, you're like, oh, crap. Like, what did I do? Then in the morning, you just tell them, again, you know, I, I screwed up. Sorry, guys. But, you know, this is what we have to do instead. And it, it's not a big deal. If, if, if you make sure it's not a big deal, then it won't be a big deal for them. If it keeps happening, though, right, if you, if you keep misteaching things for, you know, ten times in a row, then, then maybe it's a problem. Maybe you'll, you'll need some more support. But um, usually it's not a problem. Um, and then Greg. Were you able to get along with the normal older teachers, or do they not like TFA? That's what I'm worried about. Great question. I actually put that in the uh, one of my upcoming slides. That was actually the next slide. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Greg. Things I learned. Uh, most teachers do not hate TFA core members. They, they really don't. The big thing is be, you know, be someone who shows up to work on time, preferably early, Someone who stays late, or you know, you don't have to stay late all the time. But for someone where you know they actually see you doing some club, or they see you coaching, rather they see you dedicated, and someone who's humble, right? Every teacher has a difficult time, no matter if they've been there, you know, 15, 20 years. Everyone has tough days, and so if you're honest about it, and and you know, and and you complain about the hard days with, with the rest of them, 
So they'll see you as one of them, and it's not a big deal. Um, there, were, there were a lot of teachers, I mean, my, the, a lot of the schools you go to, there's a huge, huge turnover rate. At my school when I started, I think there, I think over half, half the staff was new. In my third year, uh, after I left, over half the staff was new. So it is a, a good possibility that you will just be a new teacher like everyone else, and there's no even reason to bring up TFA, right? You, you, like you don't have to say like you know where are you from or what, what did you do. Um, you, you just tell them what school you went to or like where you're who you're from originally, and if they ask about TFA, obviously tell them. But it's just not a big deal. Um, and as long as you work hard and you show that you're dedicated to the kids um, and you're friendly, right? I mean, like know their names, like you know. Say hello to, to the other teachers, um, then then you won't have any problems. There might be one or two teachers who are cranky, but you're always going to have cranky people. So, um, yeah. All right. So I think that, that answered the question. Hopefully. Um, and the other things I learned. Uh, two other things. Teachers work best as a team, and that goes back to what I just said. Um, if you show that you really want to help the kids and you are going to you know, work as a team member and you're going to share things that you have from, because there are a lot of things that you learn and resources that you get from TFA that no other teacher gets. And so if you're willing, and, and, and that's one of the things that like teachers always say, just like share things, right, or steal things. Stealing is totally fine. Just be that person who will gladly give your resources and the worksheets you found and things you have from other TFA members. And if you give things to them, they'll give things to you. And that's the best way to get planned, sharing resources, planning together, trying to create uh, assessments together, worksheets together. Um, I, you know, that's one of the things that I, I wish I had done more of. I, I did, you know, I, I did a good amount of it. But if I had done more, I would have been an even better teacher. Um, and then finally, I learned that. Uh, Teaching is hard. It's really, really exhausting. Um, and if you want to be a great teacher, it's even more exhausting because there's always more that you can do for certain kids. Um, you know, they're English language learners, so there's always more that you can do to provide those students. Um, you know, there's always more you can do for the special education students and for and for those that are you know really, really high uh, achievers. There's always more that you can do to push them. And um, it, you know, some things will fall through the cracks, and, and you just try your best. Um, but it is hard to be a great teacher, and it takes a lot of energy. But at the end of the day, it's way, way more rewarding than a vast majority of the jobs out there. And and you will have families who who almost make you a part of their families. I know a number of teachers who went to quinceañeras, um, which like the you know the becoming fifteen for. Um, uh, for female Latinas, um, and there are a lot of teachers who get invited to those, and you know you just become part of the community, um, and it's really rewarding, and you get to help out these students in in ways that you can never really even imagine at this point in time. So um, uh, it's really hard work, but I think at the end of the day, it, it'll be probably the most rewarding job you'll ever have. So uh, I, I see that it's a little past 10. I had a couple more slides. Um, I don't know, it's up to you guys if you want me to say more. Um, but I, I think I've, I've said most of what I needed to. Um, Tony, uh, do, you, do you think uh, keep going? Uh, I, I think you've been great. If there's anything else that you want to cover, then I'm you know, more than happy to stay on. And if anyone has any last questions they want to ask Ricky um, about TFA, um, Ricky, you mentioned that you were um, willing to have people reach out to you. What's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, email's fine. I mean, e even if you want to call me, that's totally fine. How about I, can I just like put it in this little chat box? Yep, that's perfect. Gotcha. And then do you, um, yep, that's perfect. There, there's my email. All right, don't sell my phone number to anybody. Here it is. And uh, yeah, no, seriously, feel free to, to call me anytime, email. Um, I'm happy to, to, to help out. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I know. I'm looking at you, Joseph. <laughs> well, in that case, that's perfect. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And for anyone that joined on the YouTube channel, um, you'll be able to get Ricky's presentation. We'll be sending that around tomorrow, um, as well as the video that you just saw. Um, so again, thanks, everyone, for joining us here. And Ricky, thank you very much. Of course, Greg, Joseph, Rebecca, thanks so much for, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And again, uh, contact me anytime. Perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.